Spoilers for the 4.1 Quest Unfinished Comedy. The story of Narcissenkreutz continues, so we first learned about the existence of Narcissenkreutz all the way back in patch 3.6. This was through Renee's investigation notes and the Nymph's Dream artifact set. Funny enough, back then I was like, hey, Arlecchino runs an orphanage, and Narcissenkreutz was an orphanage, so what if Arlecchino had links to Narcissenkreutz? Because, uh, orphans, yeah, the orphan connection. Turns out, there could be a potential connection, but it's way more bonkers than I had ever imagined. In 3.6, we also unknowingly learned about another Narcissenkreutz Ordo member. In the Artist Adrift World Quest, we learn that the artist Julian was gifted with the ability to replicate what he sees perfectly in a painting. Even with this gift, though, he struggles with the fact that he's colorblind or can't differentiate colors. The gift grantor was named Caterpillar, and this Caterpillar also told him to go on the Oceanid's pilgrimage to find a cure for his ailment, and that's why he's in Sumeru in the first place. In the World Quest Unfinished Comedy, we meet this mysterious gift grantor in the Fortress of Meripede. Caterpillar, or just Catter, is the caretaker for the young La Noire, and he's determined to get her out and return her to her family. We learn that Catter has been at the fortress for longer than anyone else there, and he has an illness which causes his present appearance. We also learn that his wish or gift granting ability is really more a talent of persuasion. He simply convinced Julian that he had an artistic gift, and also convinced a guard that despite Catter's missing records, everything is as it should be. A Jedi mind trick, if you will, but it only really works with the truth. He says that the purer the person, the more easily they are to be persuaded towards said truth. Oh yeah, Caterpillar is also a shape-shifting hilly churl who was locked up 400 years ago due to his involvement with the Narcissenkreutz Ordo. So, yeah. Caterpillar says that the first thing he remembers in this body is the great mage Narcissenkreutz. He had used the Holy Sword of Narcissenkreutz to revive or reincarnate him into a new form. So Narcissenkreutz became his master and he had acted for him, and acknowledges that he did a lot of bad stuff for this evil plan to save the world. Catter seems aware of his past life, like very vaguely before his rebirth, but really not much else of his origin. But I'm pretty sure Narcissenkreutz is Rene, plus whatever other consciousness he had absorbed. So it may be an assemblage of minds, but Rene, as the leader of the Ordo, would be the dominant personality. And as for Catter, I think this is supposed to be Carter. As a refresher, Carter was a research assistant for Elaine Guillotine and was described by Elaine and Rene as unreliable and stupid, respectively. However, he was still friends with, or at least on friendly terms with, Elaine, Marianne, and Rene, but he was an exceptionally close friend to Jacob Ingold. Carter was also suffering from some sort of sickness. This would render him unconscious for extended periods, and I also suspect may have caused some of his clumsiness in the lab. I say this because it low-key reminds me of Elazar with Carter and Cole's shared clumsiness, and Elazar victims falling into a coma. This is some side note speculation, but Elinus did pollute the waters around the time of the Cataclysm, so I wonder if Fontaine had their own minor version of an abyss-based affliction. Anyway, I digress. So Carter got so sick that Rene, at Jacob's urging, turned to Transcendence as a way to save Carter, using the same procedure he did to Jacob. Jacob was dying in the Sumeru Desert, and the procedure not only saved him, but he lives on centuries later. He can also turn into an Abyssling, but I'm personally unsure if he could do that before eating the flesh of Elinus. But Carter's Transcendence was unsuccessful. Carter seems to have turned into something more monstrous. After this oopsie, Rene still wanted to save Carter and prepare him for his rebirth. It may be that Rene found a way to basically preserve his consciousness, like maybe by absorbing him, and transfer that consciousness into a new form. He did mention that, with the right organ, consciousness can be implanted in his enigmatic pages. I do have some alternative thoughts on this topic, but I wanted to talk about what's on everyone's mind. The fourth Fatui Harbinger, the Knave, Arlecchino. Arlecchino has a very distinct defining feature that has been debated since the Final Feast trailer. Okay, aside from her eyes, though. 
So the question is, are those gloves? Hey, you can totally buy gradient gloves with nails, so it's not a weird question, I think. Slay Queen. But the Archon Quest, I think, very intentionally highlighted her arms with her assassin outfit, so I'm inclined to think it's a physical feature. And this is a feature she shares with Caterpillar. He also has darkened or blackened extremities, which he originally attributes to his illness. So this could imply a few things, assuming that they might share a similar origin. One is that Arlecchino was actually a member, or even just an experiment, of the Narcissenkreutz Ordo. Catter says that he was supposed to be the first and last of his kind, but that may be a lack of knowledge on his end. But Arlecchino is also described to have been quite young when she overtook the former knave, so I'm not sure how the timeline might work. Alternatively, perhaps someone else simply found Renee's notes and did the same rebirth ritual. But honestly, there's just not enough information personally for me to speculate on any of this, unless I just completely overlooked something. So perhaps we can't deduce her exact origins, aside from the fact that she may have potentially been rebirthed. And that she may be a hilly churl with a human glamour? But regardless, I think this conversation is a distraction from an even more interesting question. And that's the reveal that she is the fourth of the Harbingers. More influential than Pulcinella or Pantalone, or perhaps stronger than Scaramouche. This could simply be just because she runs the House of the Hearth, but I wanted to speculate a bit on this. Imagine Arlecchino has some of the skills that Catter does. Longevity, shapeshifting, general martial prowess. But imagine she might also have the same gift of persuasion, strongly pulling people towards a truth that becomes their reality. Hear me out. I wonder if that's part of her shtick, getting people to agree with her. I mean, even in the Archon Quest, was Arlecchino wrong with anything she said? And even when she admitted to attacking Farina, she was like, oh, don't bother telling anyone because no one will believe you, and we were like, well, I guess we can just completely drop this and forget about it. But more importantly, this gift of persuasion would actually be a very, very useful skill in running an orphanage where you train children to be loyal soldiers to the Tsaritsa. And indeed, most of, if not all of the members of the House of the Hearth we've met are extremely loyal to the house. It's all about family. Like, for example, Katarina in the Chasm. She's very convinced that what the Fatui are doing is ultimately right, and the ends justify their means. Also, side note, funny looking back at that because you have a tea party with her as well. And it turns out tea parties are actually a strategic way to control the conversation. Fatui life hacks with Arlecchino, I guess. Anyway, I just think a magical gift of persuasion would be fitting for the fourth harbinger and the leader of the House of the Hearth. Just some fun speculation. But speaking of magical arts and gifts, I want to circle back to something about Caterpillar which I alluded to but love taking. I have a little tinfoil hat theory I want to share. So I mentioned how it seems like Renee transplanted Carter's consciousness into a hilly churl. But why a hilly churl? It doesn't seem like the best receptacle for a human brain. But also, hilly churls already have some level of consciousness of their own. They have a language, they have tribes. From the Mimitomu event, we know that they have friends and can verbally express the anguish of existence. Relatable. And of course, we also know that many hilly churls are cursed former Convrians. And I don't think it's a coincidence that 3.6 not only gave us Nymph's dream and Caterpillar and Renee's investigation notes, but also introduced the hilly churl rogues. They're described as having a higher level of intelligence. Even their battle lines are more complex than regular hilly churl Raz. So here's the thing. Would Carter have overwritten or merged with a hilly churl consciousness? Here's where I want to speculate less about transplanting consciousness and simply reawakening it. Let me back up to why Renee needed to do this in the first place. When Carter was sick, with an illness that personally reminds me of Elazar, Jacob wanted to save his bestie. So Jacob suggested to Renee, using the same procedure Renee used to save him, to save Carter. After Renee's procedure, Carter turned into some sort of monster or body horror. 
He was alive, but his tissue was disintegrating or collapsing and needed to be stabilized. Rene talks about organs where his vocal cords should have been and how they regenerated if they were cut out. This thing also has Carter's voice. So what if Carter was initially transformed into a hilly churl? A regular but sickly or incapacitated one. The notes are vague enough that we can't necessarily rule that out. And it would make sense then that Carter's reborn form is an advanced hilly churl rogue. Consider this. The Sumeru Dainsliff quest showed us that Kari Bear's consciousness was still inside him and could be reawoken. This was due to the power of the sinner. After that, Kari Bear had his personality, his memories, even his voice back. He even went through some sort of transformation, the result of which we don't know. I've talked about higher order powers before, like Kavarna and Abyssal Power, which can rewrite the rules and have a will. The sinner would reflect Abyssal Power in this case. So perhaps Rene found such a power with a will to evolve Haley Churl Carter. Remember, the initial procedure was all about evolution and transcendence in the first place. Rene has always been interested in evolution as well as power with will. This is obviously just a lot of speculation, but here's the part I want to highlight about the initial procedure, assuming that the premise holds any water. Rene did the same transcendence procedure on two different people. One was successful and the other was not. The successful one, Jacob, is confirmed to be different. Like Rene, his body structure resembles the Galkarina more than it did Mr. Carl. Rene probably would have described this as human versus neo-human. We might assume this difference is why his was successful and Carter's was not. Jacob survived death and has lived for 500 years and can change into an abyssling. In contrast, according to my proposition, Carter changed into a hilly churl from the same procedure. Okay, now this might be a wild question, but where else have we seen a situation where two people with different genetic or molecular makeup or a physical composition underwent a change? One gained immortality and the other turned into a hilly churl. Imagine that it was not just two people, it was two entire groups of people. Imagine, then, that it's not a coincidence that Rene learned about this procedure from Conrian notes. Listen, all I'm trying to say is that I have always been skeptical of the claim that the curse was from Celestia, or the Heavenly Principles. I've also been skeptical that there are two different curses. And in my Conrians or Dragons video, I also suggested that perhaps full-blooded Conrians did not turn into hilly churls simply because they could not turn into hilly churls. This is based on the premise that full-blooded Conrians are entirely different from regular human beings. So here is what I want to suggest. We know that Conrio was taking a little peeksy beyond the sky, and someone there created or found the beastly rifts where the bad dogs come from. We also know that Conria had a little tango with forbidden knowledge and had a disdain for the gods. So what if the curse was actually just another thing they were doing to try and oppose the heavens, for example, or even transcend? Although perhaps this wasn't the intended outcome. Although for a much sadder crack theory and interpretation of this, maybe someone simply was trying to save the Conrians at all costs. Just as Rene was trying to save Jacob. And, for what it's worth, Rene did seem aware that this power had questionable origin. But anyway, once again, this is all just speculation. And yes, I'm aware that I somehow made this all about Conria, so sorry for the clickbait, I guess. What I will say, though, is that they are going to great lengths to make us care about Narcissenkreutz, between all the world quests intertwining and also having links to the main crisis Fontaine is facing. So in that sense, I think Renee's story could be a really, really clever vehicle for delivering some hints or even metaphors for what's going on in the bigger story. Because keep in mind, we really haven't heard anything about our sibling in Fontaine. Okay, so again, I know this was all a lot of speculation, and it also leaves quite a few questions unanswered. Jacob and Renee are obviously not Conrian, but there is something about their makeup that is special. They're neo-humans. But I also wonder about just how special their makeup is. 
For example, Rene had hypothesized that Jacob was the extreme case. But what if Carter was actually the outlier and whatever sort of neo-human status they have is actually more widespread than we think in Fontaine? Like, perhaps so widespread in Fontaine that all Fontanians can dissolve in primordial seawater? This has a lot of wild implications. For example, this could mean that Renee's original plan could have worked. And of course, there are still a few other outstanding questions. For example, if Arlequino was originally a hilly churl, then she really could have just come from anywhere and been reborn in Fontaine, right? And maybe, 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 perhaps this means there's an entire ancient civilization we don't know about yet that had her unique cross-shaped eyes. And there's also this major implication that there is a way to cure the curse, or at least subvert it. But I won't get into this because I wanted to keep this video a little on the shorter side. Thank you all for watching and enduring my torture. Please like, comment, and subscribe and hit that notification bell. Share your own thoughts and theories in the comments. And make sure to check the batteries in your smoke detectors to make sure they're working. Stay safe. Okay, bye.